We've talked about important motorcycle innovations, the big inventions added to make bikes significantly better, and sort of the little improvements that have carried over till today. The kind of stuff that just isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Things like disc brakes or ABS or traction control. But with any long storied industry, you're bound to have some ideas flop. And that's kind of what this video is about. Not so much bad ideas, just inventions and innovations that for whatever reason really haven't caught on. So without further ado, let's jump in and look at 10 motorcycle innovations that just didn't catch on. Let's kick things off with a feature that has existed on a few different motorcycles in history and even today one specifically, and that is all-wheel drive or two-wheel drive. And the most well-known company that utilizes this is Rokon with their big-wheeled trail all-terrain bikes. Essentially, these are like, you know, big Honda three-wheelers from the 80s and 90s, but with two wheels. And that's right, all-wheel drive. Now you can buy all-wheel drive kits for other motorcycles like you're seeing here with KTM's big adventure bike and the advantages are obvious. Way more traction, right? But I don't believe that this feature of having two-wheel or all-wheel drive motorcycles or an option to turn it on comes as stock on any major manufacturer's bikes. Rokon's motorcycles are specifically meant for that slow sort of trail riding, big bumpy rocks. Think of, you know, sort of the Jeep of motorcycles. It's not like a KTM dirt bike that you can take on trails, but that's really meant for racing. I mean, the Rokons produce like seven horsepower or something like that. Now, this is a true trail bike. It's very torquey, and I mean, it floats for God's sake, you know, just in case you drive the thing straight into a river. But the all-wheel drive on this bike is really quite novel. It's very mechanical. It's basically a drivetrain that travels up from the transmission under the tank to a transfer box between the handlebars, which essentially drives a sprocket and chain to the front wheel. It's really simple, but really effective, and it makes it so that Rokons can travel up massive hills and over large rocks and logs and just do things that other motorcycles, basically all other motorcycles in the world, cannot. Now, I'm sure there are good reasons dirt bikes and adventure bikes from the major manufacturers have not yet employed this, but to me, this really should be something that, you know, could be paid extra for, like an extra feature on some of the big adventure bikes. And this all-wheel drive feature, this really is why people get Rokons. You know, this is what people want from them is, you know, having both of those big wheels able to be utilized on like all sorts of terrain makes it so that this bike can do things that other motorcycles just simply cannot. Number nine goes to grip shifts. So classic Vespas and Lambrettas have this awesome little feature that really never caught on beyond these two marks and didn't really carry on into the future either. But basically, instead of having the clutch and the shifter in two different places, as is common for any manual transmission, whether you're using a car or a motorcycle, the clutch and the shifter are both a part of the left grip. So essentially, you pull in the clutch and then twist the whole mechanism, like the entire grip, into gear and then let the clutch out. And it's great because you can easily see what gear you're in right there, almost like an early gear indicator, but better than my old Triumph's gear indicator, which is way down on top of the transmission. But I do use that sometimes, guys. But that's it. You know, you pull in the clutch, twist the whole mechanism, and then let the clutch out. It's so genius and simple and really innovative. You know, the best kind of innovations are the ones that are simple and make sense. But for whatever reason, I don't believe that this really went beyond these two Italian scooters. I'm curious if any of you experts watching this video could tell us why. I'm sure that these had their problems, but you know, so do most transmissions. But outside of scooters, you know, because that entire market has really moved away from any sort of manual transmission altogether for the most part, I do wonder if this could work on just traditional motorcycles. It seems like a really sensible option. Now, number eight goes to really any form of front suspension beyond just the typical double fork tubes. But specifically, though, I find it odd that no companies, for the most part, have really taken on the novel form of suspension used on the Great Britain motorcycles. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with John Britton and his race bike endeavors, I've made an entire video about that story, and I believe it's my most viewed video. Anyways, Britain created a form of front suspension. Basically, this was a fully adjustable girder style suspension with an Olin's racing shock fitted right in the middle. And it's pretty complex, but the thing to know is that it has serious advantages over the traditional front fork setup. But here's the thing, 
it looks very different. And I think it's difficult for companies to fathom what their bikes would look like with this form of suspension. I mean, traditional suspension is part of the overall design of motorcycles. And because, you know, the setup that we have today on motorcycles hasn't really changed much over the past 50 years, it's become part of the design. You know, function has its purpose. But in this case, when you change this function, you would be changing the design so much of the motorcycle that I think it would hurt branding for people and for companies. So I think that's really the main reason why, because this has so many advantages over the traditional setup. All right, number seven, we have, you know, sort of the auto ped, you could call it. Now, there have been quite a few sort of hybrid car motorcycles over the past 100 years from large coach chair bikes to today. You know, those weird three wheeled things that are technically considered motorcycles. Never really understood that one. But specifically, I'm talking about motorcycles, true two wheeled vehicles that have roofs. I mean, even Honda got in on this at one point with the Honda gyro canopy. Though that did technically have three wheels. The BMW C1 was a true two-wheeler, but like all other attempts at sort of making a car motorcycle, riders just weren't interested. Those with four-wheeled aspirations really have no reason for something like this, and scooter and motorcycle enthusiasts want a traditional-looking motorcycle with no roof. Motorcycles are inherently meant to be convertibles. You can quote me on that one. Regardless of the advantages, and for some models, there are plenty, look no further than Fortnite's video about the Electrom sort of version of this idea, but slightly different. Regardless, these sort of motorcycle car hybrids just haven't stuck, and in my opinion, it makes sense. Motorcycles are motorcycles. They aren't really purchased by consumers whose primary goal is safety and comfort. So, you know, when you spoil the overall look that much with something like a roof, it's really hard to see the point, I think. All right, number six goes to linked brakes. So when I think of linked brakes on a motorcycle, I think of Moto Guzzi's from the 70s, as well as some BMWs and Hondas. But on Moto Guzzi's, say California, for example, essentially there was a big pedal on the floor and that pedal simply engages both the front and rear brakes. Now, this never really caught on and even Moto Guzzi stopped using it for pretty obvious reasons, being able to use utilize the front and rear brake in different capacities and at different levels does a lot for you, more for you than just, you know, enabling you to do stoppies and burnouts. ABS is another category where braking can be combined in ways, but the idea of having just one brake controlling both wheels the way that we have on cars, that is just long gone. And it's actually illegal in the United States to not have separate brakes. So this is one of those things that could have maybe made sense and in a very high-tech environment where it could all be sort of regulated, maybe it would work, but for now, having them separate just makes sense. All right, number five goes to oval pistons. So Honda decided to do something ridiculous with their MotoGP race bike in 79, an oval piston 500cc race bike. Oval, so that there would be more room for more valves. Now the production NR750 would also utilize oval pistons, but the bike really had little more in terms of performance as the production bike from Honda that was already there, the 750 VFR, but the NR750 had a whopping 32 valves, 8 valves per cylinder. Essentially this bike is a V8 in V4 form. Now, some have called this, in terms of racing and production, the right kind of failure. You know, failing, but still innovating. Oval pistons don't actually do that much better of a job than regular pistons. This model was fraught with problems and rarely saw success on the racetrack. But it's the spirit behind the endeavor that's really cool. Regardless, I don't believe any other motorcycle or vehicle in general has ever utilized oval pistons. I could be wrong about this, but from what I've looked up, Seems like Honda is pretty rare in this. And Honda has certainly had their fair share of features that have taken over in the industry, but this wasn't one of them. Still, the NR750 is one of the most collectible, expensive, classic sport bikes that you can buy. Number four on our list goes to automatic transmissions. Now, of course, there's been various versions of automatic transmissions on motorcycles. Semi-automatic transmissions like the original and current Honda Super Cub, where you basically just have to let off the throttle to shift. And even that model and that system really hasn't taken on in the market as a whole. But I'm more talking about the kind of automatic transmission that we see in cars, a transmission that runs through the gears up and down on its own. 
In the 70s, Honda released what was known as the Hondamatic. This type of transmission would take multiple forms, but essentially it removed the need for a clutch. You still had to shift, but there was no need to fiddle with clutch action. And the goal here was to make the 750cc platform from Honda even more accessible to new or non-riders, but it never really took off the way that Honda would have wished, despite it being a great platform. Now the closest thing we have is Honda's current DCT, which is utilized on multiple premium motorcycles in their lineup. Though the setup is different, it functions basically like an automatic for the user. You know, electric motorcycles are similar, again, in experience, no need for shifting or clutch action, but still a purely conventional automatic transmission like we see in virtually every modern car, that system just really hasn't taken off in the motorcycle world. Number three on our list is something you may not think is possible, but we may be heading this direction at some point, and that is self-driving or self-riding or self-balancing motorcycles. Honda has a prototype of a self-driving motorcycle. There's a video of it just sort of putzing around an office and adapting to keep the rider upright. Now, even though electric and lots of other tech involved in the electric vehicle production has sort of started to trickle over to motorcycling, it seems like motorcycles are always a little bit behind cars in terms of tech, but full-blown self-driving tech doesn't seem to be taking off in any meaningful way, and you know, there's doubts about it ever even working for cars, honestly. Yamaha is apparently working on something that they're calling, I think, power steering, which would involve computer inputs to the bike steering, but this isn't full-blown autopilot like we see on tech-heavy cars. Self-driving motorcycles and honestly, lots of the other new rider aids that might be coming just don't really make a whole lot of sense to me. I get more comfort and better safety options. You know, I, I understand that to some extent, but personally, I don't want a computer taking over the controls when I'm on a motorcycle. It's just not the same as a car. Traction control and ABS are fine, but I don't know, leave the turning to me. That's why I'm riding a motorcycle. It's not just to get to, you know, point A. It's to be able to have that input and that experience of being in complete control. Now, I could be wrong, maybe people would be interested in riding self-driving motorcycles, but I just don't really get the point. <laughs> All right, number two on our list goes to hub center steering. Now, this is one of those novel ideas that does seem to make sense on paper and has been used in various two-wheeled applications dating all the way back to the early 1900s. Basically, the wheel essentially rotates on a pivot on the front axle instead of the traditional fork setup where the wheel turns with, you know, the forks and the entire headstock. Essentially, you're separating the braking and suspension mechanics from the steering mechanics, which is good in theory, but again, really hasn't proven itself. Now, this is most notably used on some Bomoda motorcycles and some other bespoke bikes, but really the only attempt that I know of from a major manufacturer was Honda's GTS 1000 from the mid-90s, a bike that did have some advantages utilizing this, but again, the extra cost and weight really didn't outweigh the advantages. I wonder if hub center steering could be the future of motorcycles in terms of even high performance bikes but it's just not something that has received enough attention from major manufacturers and it hasn't had that investment to potentially take over but at this point it's just really not going anywhere now last on our list is really a true tragedy and that is turbocharged motorcycles and you could lump superchargers into this as well but that system has proven itself to really make at least some sense with the H2 platform from Kawasaki, but turbocharged bikes are really a different story. Sure, there are plenty of turbo boosts out there, and Yemi Noob's recent set of videos delving into actually having one built is really interesting. <laughs> But even those videos really show how much it costs and how much work it is to do this. A turbo busa doesn't really make much sense practically, at least for production motorcycles. I mean, maybe supercharged bikes don't really either, but I think a turbo busa could cost maybe even more than an H2 if Suzuki actually decided to go that route. Now, the 1980s were kind of a golden era for production turbo bikes. There was the Honda CX line and other manufacturers like Suzuki got in on it. But in the end, the reality was that a 1000cc superbike without a turbo was still just faster than the ones with turbos. Turbo bikes are significantly heavier. Now, with the right work done, of course, a turbo-powered Hayabusa produces ridiculous power. And it does work in a straight line. But in terms of overall performance and weight, turbo-powered bikes just 
don't make a whole lot of sense in the market as a whole. I still think that Suzuki should just man up and at least make a version of a Turbo Busa with more horsepower than the H2. You know, I think it's time Suzuki made stupid motorcycles again, but I think we all know that's probably not happening. All right, guys, there you have it. 10 motorcycle innovations that really never caught on. Hope you guys enjoyed this and make sure to let us know down in the comments if there's any ones that I missed because obviously there's lots of other things that also have not really caught on in the motorcycle world. So hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're riding safe and we'll see you next time. Peace out.